but I've got it ready to go if I need. So yes, I have the responses. Okay, awesome. thanks. So I'll let Jeannie know when it's time to, uh, to well, Ben or I will let Jeannie know when we should go live, right? Yep. Senator Zucker, we also went live a little too early, so I just want to let you know we're live now, so maybe okay. turn off the camera. Okay, well, first of all, welcome everybody who's watching. Uh, we're going to be getting started in a little bit. Our start time is 1.30, so we're waiting for committee to jump on. So just as uh, people are coming on, just wanted to let you know that right now we're uh, streaming live and for the public that are, uh, that are listening, uh, our meeting, as you can see, will start at 1.30. Mr. Chairman, you say we're already live. We are, uh, Mr. Chairman. So we uh, we went we went live a little early. We just wanted to let people know how excited we were to start our first joint public uh, public uh, budget hearing together. So uh, 
I know Mr. Chairman will give him time and, and then uh, you'll be kicking us off, sir. Good. Just give everybody another minute. Is that good? Yeah, sounds good. All right, cool. Mr. Chairman, I thought you and I would just switch off uh, switch off uh, budgets. This isn't new to us. We've been doing this all year, and we did it with spending affordability. So yeah, we'll just hand them and, uh, informal. I think that's fine. What else did we have, Mr. Chairman? Pensions. We did that together as well. I just, you know, I just missed you. <laughs> All right, well, it's uh, no, we two more minutes. wait for if we can just wait for one more of uh, our subcommittee to show up. I know uh, Senator King is on, but let's wait for at least one more member of uh, Education Business Administration to jump on. Did I join the right meeting here? <laughs> Hey, Delegate Greist. I guess I did. <laughs> Jeff, you're supposed to be in the other meeting. It's just uh, down the hall, third door on the right. I gotcha. Gotcha. I have to go move up three more emails, I suppose. That's right. I forgot these are joint meetings now. Sorry that the Senate has to put up with the riffraff from the House. Uh huh. I was thinking it was the other way around. <laughs> Chair Zucker, it looks like you have a couple of more uh, senators on here. Senator Alfred, you want to get going? You want to give everybody a couple more minutes? Up to you. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody to our first meeting here of EED. We want to uh, welcome new members of EED. Delegate Nabotny, welcome. And we also have Delegate Bridges, who's been promoted to EED. And we welcome back our vice chair. Congratulations to our vice chair, Delegate Chang, who will be sitting in as a member of EED as well. With that, Mr. Chairman Zucker, you have any introductions? It's uh, soon uh, Delegate uh, Paul Quarterman will be, uh, Senator Paul Quarterman will be joining us. He was a former delegate, colleague of yours, and uh, he's a new member of uh, Education Business Administration. Excellent. We have a robust schedule here. We're starting with the Maryland Stadium Authority. So we will, uh, I believe Patrick Frank will be our analyst, Mr. Frank. Hello, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Um, it says host disabled participant sharing. Um, let's try again. You should be able to share. All right, I think here it is. Okay. Does everybody see that? Figure this out. All right. All right. Yeah, this is the Stadium Authority's budget. It's, um, it has an interesting mission. Some of the things it does is it manages the Orioles and Raven Stadiums. It also is uh, 
provides financing and construction management for school construction projects in Baltimore City and soon the, um, the Laurel Park and Pimlico racetracks. Also, it does some sports marketing for the state and economic studies. You can see from the first page, the funding is mostly non-budgeted that it generates through, through the, either the bond sales for the construction projects or its own um, non-budgeted revenues. This year on page two, the budget will be receiving uh, two, or as, as has um, the administration proposes, I should say, two deficiencies. One is $4 million, and that has to do with um, revenues um, being lower than anticipated in fiscal 2020 and 2021. And there's an exhibit later that shows this very well. A second um, deficiency is $100,000, and that is for sports marketing to um, bring the FIFA World Cup games in 2026 into to Maryland. Uh, next exhibit I'd like to show you is on page three. This um, is an exhibit that shows the spending. And as you can see, almost two thirds of the spending are for that school construction in Baltimore City. Um, that is by far the largest share of it. On page four is the revenues that it generates. As you would expect, if the largest share of spending is Baltimore City, um, then the revenues also are, are gonna be supporting Baltimore City. On um, that yellow section here, that has to do with the revenues that the agency generates on its own. And that's just, this is where the problem is with and why they are getting the deficiency. Uh, and let's see, on pages five and six, and all the way through nine, I provided some details, the specific dollars for all the different um, programs that the agency has with a description. In the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip over that. But if you have questions, we can certainly discuss them. Um, what's interesting in this agency are the observations, and they begin on page 10. The first is the Baltimore City School Construction Program that I mentioned. Um, exhibit 4 on page 10 and 11 shows uh, the status of all the different schools. To date, 15 schools have been completed. I believe there's another 13 that are still being um, designed and constructed. And it's, it's this chart starts from the last to open, which is December in 2023. And it kind of goes through and shows you the, the status of all the different schools. The funding source for this is the um, transport, or excuse me, the um, stadium authority gets $60 million annually for 30 years to pay the debt service. What they've done is they've borrowed as much as they can so they can do as many schools as they can. And $20 million of that is from the Maryland lottery. The second observation that I have deals with the Racing and Community Development Act of 2020. What that is, is that is funding for Pimlico and the community around Pimlico, as well as Laurel Park. This is a similar arrangement in that they get $17 million in lottery revenues uh, for which they can borrow and then make the improvements. On page 15, exhibit six is a pretty good discussion. And Mr. Frank, shows, can you, can, can you move, the, we're still stuck on page one. That's what everybody could see. Are you able to get oh to, my. you're reflecting? Uh, let's let me try again, I thought, let me, let me try this. I'm on. That's all right. You're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, but you do see me right? yeah, during this interesting time, but uh, just uh, just for a committee that may not have the analysis in front of them, uh, just having a hard time following along. I'm we sure can see you and we can see page one. We just haven't moved along from that. Sure. The page is on the left corner there. Okay. All right. Let me see. All righty. It, on mine, it is moving along. I'm not sure why that is. Let's let me try something different here. Okay, resume share. I'm going to try to stop the share and try again. I may have shared wrong. Okay, can you see now the analysis? And do you see page 15 or page one? Yeah, 15. 15. Okay, excellent. All right, this is the, the exhibit that we should be on now. And um, like, I, okay, I'll show you here. Um, let's see. Uh, what it is is the top part of this exhibit shows what they anticipate that the um, bonds will generate for the two projects. There's $180 million is, is at a minimum goes to Pimlico and the 
community around it. And $155 million at a minimum goes to Laurel Park. And there is an undesignated amount, which they will um, find. And so if, if once again, as with the school system, if they generate more than $375 million, then they, they can do more. And if it's less, then they'll have to, to, to manage that. Um, the bottom part of the table shows how the revenues are supporting this. Um, in order to get this of uh, a higher bond rating, what they've done is they've dedicated lottery revenues for this. And that's $17 million a year for, for 30 years. And that'll pay the debt service. To, um, to, to help the lottery's position and to provide some money, the horse racing industry has offered some other revenues like the purse dedication account and some of the... Um, some of those other smaller revenues. And so that, that money then will be going into the lottery in order to offset the 17 million annually that will go for this project. And the last exhibit I'd like to show you, and you should be seeing page 18, exhibit number seven. And this is the, what they call the Camden Yards Financing Fund. Um, this is our, the sources and uses. And this is really what pays for the operations of the stadium authority. And what you can see here is the problem is pretty easy and it's not hard to explain, honestly. And that is these lines here is, these are revenues that it generates, the admissions taxes and the baseball rent. Because there were no fans at the games in this last year, and there may not be some for part of this year, these revenues are quite a bit lower than otherwise would have been. Now in 22, you can see they're back to the normal level uh, or, close, or closer to their normal level in most of these cases. So, so the problem that they have is, as you can see, they ended fiscal 2020 with a, basically a $4 million um, deficit. And that was primarily because of the lower revenues. Uh, the administration proposes 4 million, that'll make them whole for 20. 20, but there is still, even with that, a $7 million deficit anticipated. So there may be, we will see, have to see how this budget plays out, how the season plays out. So there are some, still are some concerns about their, their budget. And, um, and that, that ex explains their, their um, deficiency. And I'll go to the last page I'm going to discuss is the, our recommendation is to concur with the governor's allowance. Um, and that concludes my presentation. I can answer questions. Hey, thank you, sir. Great presentation. Are there any questions for our analyst? Just raise your hand on the reactions button. I don't see any. Mr. Chairman, you see anything? Okay. So let's move to uh, Director Friends and his team. Welcome. Um, th thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairs Barnes and Zucker and members of the committee. I'm Michael Friends, Executive Director of the Maryland Stadium Authority. And joining me today are our chair, Thomas Kelso, Chief Financial Officer, David Wraith, Executive Vice President of our Capital Projects Development Group, Gary McGuigan, and Terry Hasseltine, the Executive Director of Maryland Sports, the State Sports Commission. I'll be very brief here. Um, we've received and reviewed the analyst's report in advance of the hearing, and would like to thank him for his thorough analysis. We've provided you with a PowerPoint deck that complements the analyst's report. We don't plan to go through the entire thing, although we may want to highlight one or two slides during um, the course of any questions. Um, in 2020, despite the challenging environment of the COVID-19 pandemic, we continued to deliver upon our promise of on time on budget project completion. And it was a proud moment for everyone at MSA when Governor Hogan announced that an additional $60 million is available for school construction due to efficient project and fiscal management of the 21st century school buildings program in Baltimore. Thus far, MSA has delivered 17 modernized school buildings on time and approximately 5% under budget. And we're on track to deliver on the top end of our estimate of 23 to 28 schools. By working in partnership with the Orioles and Ravens, Oriole Park at Camden Yards and M&T Bank Stadium remain first class facilities in Major League Baseball and the National Football League and we continue to make improvements to the warehouse. Our facilities and securities people also ensured that the Camden Yard Sports Complex was a safe and secure place for warehouse tenants and visitors during the pandemic. Our Maryland Sports Affiliate continues its efforts towards the Baltimore Maryland 2026 FIFA World Cup, the inaugural Maryland Cycling Classic and the Maryland Five Star Equine Event at Fairhill, the renovation of which was overseen by MSA to substantial acclaim. Also event planners and venue owners across the state were highly appreciative of the return to play resource center guide for amateur and youth sports developed by Maryland Sports. This past year by teaming up with various not-for-profits, MSA helped provide nourishing meals to Marylanders in need, 
holiday gifts for children and a safe socially distanced place to vote during the November election. Soon M&T Bank Stadium will be used as a mass, mass vaccination site. In closing, we're here to serve. Mr. Wraith is prepared to, dis, to brief the committees on how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected our revenues and we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is David Wraith. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Maryland Stadium Authority. So it's been a little bit of a challenge this year um, with regards to revenues for Camden Yards. Um, Camden Yards primarily operates off of four primary uh, revenue sources. The first one being is uh, we receive a rent payment from the Orioles that is based on revenues, um, a revenue stream on ticket sales, concessions, parking, and advertising. Um, the second source is we get reimbursed from the Baltimore Ravens for all the operation and maintenance at M&T Bank Stadium. Uh, the third one is we receive warehouse rents uh, for the uh, commercial tenants that are inside the facility. And the fourth one is the admissions tax collected on the tickets sold. So for fiscal, for fiscal 20, we received like 50% uh, of what we would usually do for uh, baseball rent because the season is really split because we've got paid for the end of the 19 season, but then the fiscal 20 season, there wasn't any baseball games. So that's why our revenues for the year were cut in half. Um, we also had a reduced amount of admissions tax associated with um, the baseball games because of the fact that tickets weren't sold for fiscal year 20. Uh, the one positive for 20, uh, which is gonna be a negative in 21, is that the Baltimore Ravens went ahead and sold their season tickets for the entire uh, 20 football season and they paid the admissions tax to the comptroller's office which was in turn uh, turned over to us but the fact that you know there was no games you know that money would either be refunded to the season ticket holders or be applied to the 21 season so I would probably expect that we wouldn't get any admissions tax uh, related to football games in 21 if they went ahead and had fans in the stands for that year. So that is one of the major things that kind of increases that um, deficit in 21 versus 20. Um, we're very fortunate for the fact that uh, every warehouse tenant has continued to pay their rent. Uh, we restructured a few of their um, rent agreements to defer a little bit of it, but not more than three months for a handful of it. Um, but it has been a, you know, really um, a very, proud moment to the fact that everybody in this building continues to operate and live up to their commitment. So, you know, at the same time, we understand that, you know, our revenues are down, but also our expenses associated with games would be down too. Uh, we wouldn't need as much when it comes to utility costs, you know, with pressure washing the stadium, electrical needs and um, security costs, janitorial costs. So there are some benefits at the same time that even though we don't have games and not collecting revenues, there are some offset um, expenses associated with that. So, um, you know, we're currently projecting fiscal 21 to kind of, you know, move into a more of a normal pre-pandemic uh, scenario. Um, but as we see over time, that could be impacted. And, you know, as things go along, we'll continue to update the budget and provide whatever information the committee would like to see over time. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Gary, are you presenting as well, or is that it for the Mr. Friends? Is anyone else? No, th that'll be it, Delegate Barnes. Okay. Um, but, but the other gentlemen are here to answer any questions you have. Great, perfect. Well, thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions for the agency? Chair Zucker, any questions from your side? I don't see any. Okay. No. Well, thank you all very much. We know it's been hard on your agency, like so many others, but uh, we're all hoping to get back to a better fiscal 22. So thank you for your analysis and uh, being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you all. We're gonna to turn to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, Sarah Baker, I see has joined us and is our analyst. Welcome, Sarah. Trying to see if I can, I can't share my screen yet. Chairman Barnes, can you see, see me at UMES? Sorry. Can you hear uh, me? Yes, we can. Okay, can. thank you. Yep. 
We're going to hear from the analyst and then we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Um, I can't share my screen. <laughs> I can. Uh, you, you have co-hosting. Let's see if I can. Okay. I'll, I'll do it again. Let's see. Okay. I said it was disabled. <laughs> Okay, try again. Okay. You should be, you should be, you should have it. Is. Yeah, thank you. Okay, hopefully you can see all exhibit one there. So I'm gonna start um, showing the change in the fall undergraduate headcount enrollment. And as you can see for the fourth year, enrollment fell by 10.6% in 2020, and this may partly reflect the impact of COVID as students may have decided to stay closer to home or quit off going to college for a year. I do want to note on the positive side, um, graduate enrollment increased by 24 students reflecting the reinstitution of the physician assistance program. UMES has um, initiated various programs to stabilize enrollment, which kind of seems successful if you look at the applications and you'll see in the red line that the number of applicants actually doubled for fall 2020, but at the number of students who actually enrolled, which is shown in the blue line, um, declined for a second year. Um, exhibit three shows the second and third year retention rates, and both rates declined to their lowest level with the 2015 cohort. And this was reflecting a cohort of students that were not um, ready for college. And while it has rebounded, you'll notice that the rate hasn't rebounded to the rates, the cohorts preceding the 2015 cohort. Um, exhibit four, this is the, shows the six-year graduation rate, and you can see that it increased to 51% with the 2014 cohort, but with the 2015 cohort, you'll notice it declined 46%, and again, reflecting the admission of students who may not have been college ready. So exhibit five is the eight year graduation of Pell and non-Pell students. And interesting, full-time transfer students graduate at a higher rate than first-time full-time students. And part-time Pell students graduate at the highest rate of all students. Just briefly moving on to exhibit six and affordability, which looks at the cost of attendance versus average net price. Um, 2019, the average price was about 33% less than the published price. And you'll notice that um, for families with incomes below $30,000, it was about 34% below the public price, published price. Exhibit seven shows institutional aid and number of awards. And uh, the spending reached its highest level of 7.1 million in 2015, during which time enrollment increased over 32%. The decline in spending and the numbers of awards in the preceding years reflect a continual decline in enrollment. So overall need-based aid accounts for about 27% of spending. So we asked the president to comment on the portion of institutional aid going towards need-based aid, considering that over the half the first time full-time students um, in 2018 and 19 received a PAL. Moving on to the effects, the impact COVID had on UMES exhibit nine, this shows the impact on 2020. If you recall in March, um, the institutions, all the institutions pivoted to online learning and they sent the students home. Refunds were given to students from room and board and some of the mandatory fees. So this resulted in a loss of $5.4 million in revenues, which is shown in exhibit nine. In addition, there was over $800,000 in COVID related expenses. So this resulted in a $6.2 million shortfall. So you'll notice in the revenues, UMES did receive a total of three and a half million in CARES funding. Half of that was used for, had to be used for financial aid. The other half, the 1.8 million was used to cover some of the revenue losses. They did receive over $400,000 in the state's portion of the CRF funds. And however, as you can see, that wasn't enough to cover the deficit. They had a deficit of almost $4 million. Unlike other institutions that have fund balance, to cover their shortfalls, um, UMAS had depleted its fund balance over years of budgetary challenges related to enrollment decline. So having no other sources of fund, system office did loan UMES the $4 million to cover the shortfall. So in fall, um, UMES reopened with about half the classes delivered remotely and reduced occupancy on campus. In addition, um, tuition and fees 
for in and out of state students were frozen at the 2000 um, 20 level. And so as you can see in exhibit 10, this resulted in a loss of $7.2 million in revenue. And when you include the BPW reduction, their total loss of revenue was 10.9. And if when you tack on the 4.8 million of COVID related expenses, their overall shortfall is 15.8 million for this year projected shortfall. So UMES is using a multi-prong approach to um, cover the shortfall. The first, as you can see, they're reducing various operating expenditures by $4.6 million. And then you can see the revenue sources they had. They received $7.8 million in CARES funds this year. And this was the funds specifically designated for HBCUs. There are two deficiencies that would give um, um, 3.4 million of the state's portion of the CRF. So as you can see, um, they can, they'll be able to right now cover their um, shortfall. Now we look in the proposed budget, um, you'll see, note that overall, because if you include the deficiencies um, in 21, that state funding decreases 4.5% or 2.1 million. Overall unrestricted funds decreased by 10.3 million which is related to the 7.3 million in CARES funding they received in 21 and the deficiency they are receiving. But you'll note at the bottom of the exhibit, UMES will receive five and a half million dollars from the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 21. And um, they will have till fiscal 23 to spend these funds. And also at this time, the US Department of Education has not yet allocated those funds specifically for HBCU. So we expect they'll be getting even more funding this year. On a positive note, um, in December, UMES received the 20 million unrestricted gift from Mackenzie Scott. So we asked the president to comment on how UMES plans to use this gift. Um, exhibit 12, this just shows their unrestricted revenues by source. And you can see since 2016, general funds have been comprising an increasing share of the revenues accounting for half in 2022. And you can also see that increase in the total unrestricted revenues in 21 is due to the CARES um, Act funds, which comprise about 11% of their revenues. I'm going to turn to issue one, which is uh, regarding pivot and transitioning to remote learning. So the biggest problem UMES en encountered when they pivoted to online learning in the spring semester was maintaining the connection between on and off campus networks due to bandwidth issues on the Eastern shore. Overall, despite these challenges, UMES did deem um, the pivot a success and these are listed in the second set of bullets on the page. So UMES took these lessons learned and they're listed at the bottom of the page and incorporated them into their preparation for fall. And they're noted in the bullets on the top of the page. And the next set of bullets, kind of like in the middle of the page, summarizes how UMES is maintaining the quality of its remote courses. And finally, the last set of bullets um, provide information on how UMES is providing student services in the remote environment. We asked the president to comment on efforts to provide mental health services remotely and if there has been an increase in demand, and also whether the shift to providing courses and services online has shifted the thinking on how UMES can deliver programs to students opportunities to expand its reach and the impact on their future business models. And the last is the recommendation, which is to see the US of overview, which you'll have next week. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the answers. Uh, are there any questions for Ms. Baker? I don't see any. I don't see any on the Senate side. Is that mic on now? Yep, you are on, Madam President. President awesome. Dr. Anderson, welcome. Welcome your team. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barnes. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Ex excellent. Thank you. Well, Chairman Zucker and Chairman Barnes, thank you very much. And members of the House and Senate subcommittees, we are pleased to be here today. Uh, I am President Heidi Anderson, and with me is my CFO, Mr. Lester Primus, who will be here to answer any questions. But we know that your time is valuable and we wanna be respectful of that. And you have a copy of my written uh, responses. Uh, let me let us also thank uh, Sarah Baker for her and her team analysis of our institution. And before I start into answering the questions, 
We also want to thank the entire General Assembly for all of the support that you give to our university and to Governor Hogan as well. And we appreciate the support you give to us as well as to the USM system. And uh, ask you at the front end to please uh, uh, vote favorably on the budget from the USM system, please, because it helps us out greatly. But let me start by saying, let me just remind you uh, to place things in context. I arrived September of 2018. Vice President Primus and my team came in January of 2019. And some of the things that you see as far as our applications and enrollment are were impacted from its restructuring that I did when I arrived. Prior to my arrival, there was a lot of instability in leadership and a lot of turnover. I did I outlined that for you in my written remarks. But basically, I wanted to point out that coming in, I wanted to make sure that we restructured enrollment and financial award aid for awarding and retention so that we have a more strategic, integrated, cohesive approach. And we believe that this was really making a big difference pre-COVID. You can see from the exhibits that prior to COVID, our applications had gone up. We also had awarded students financial aid, and we knew that we were going to bring in a class this fall, past fall, that was higher than previous year. However, that did not happen. Let me specifically respond to the analyst's uh, point about financial aid. In regards to this institutional aid, as you note in our remarks, we make financial aid awards to our students each semester. And each semester, we evaluate the students on a number of criteria. Uh, criteria such as what cohort they happen to be in, their GPA, their enrollment status, their FAFSA sub submission. All of these things go into, con into consideration. We worked with our students because as a school of access, we receive a number of students who obviously have low income. And we try not to eliminate all of their financial need, but we try to make sure we look at giving uh, aid to students that will help in persistence, retention, and also in graduation rate. As you've noticed in the DLS chart, UMES continues to enroll a student population with significant financial aid need, as evidence that 52% of our student population being Pell Grant eligible. UMES has exhibited an ability to attract and enroll a greater number of academically accomplished students. A notable percentage of these meritorious students have enrolled at UMES with external awards that they get from civic organization, social clubs and other various scholarship agencies. As a result, we have expended less institutional need-based aid, but it's worth noting that students who exhibit greater financial need are also beneficiaries of state funds, federal funds, and other local funding. As such, UMES is, we continue to grow in our mission of expanding access to marginalized communities. And it is inevitable that the allocation of need-based aid will increase. However, if we maintain our ability to attract and enroll academically remarkable students, that demonstrated need may be mitigated within reason. The bottom line is that we see that student success is higher for our students who get more, who receive institutional aid. And we will continue with that. Responding to the analyst um, point about the McKinsey gift, we first have to give, say that we're very honored <clears throat> And we're very humbled to have received the gift from Ms. McKin from uh, Mackenzie Scott. As you know, she had specific criteria in her research of which inst institution she awarded aid. And we recognize that this is something that we, uh, we not only cherish as the largest gift we've ever received, but we must make sure that we sustain it for the institution. So where this gift is, is at this time, it is in an endowment to ensure that we have, and that I can make sure the university has a long-term viable stability. The funds will be used in a number of areas, but specifically, first of all, for marketing and recruitment for students to our institution and for student scholarships. One of the areas that I see utilizing the funds is, let me give you an example. We want to be able to partner more closely with our, with our community colleges, not only those here on the Lower Eastern Shore, Warwick, Chesapeake, but also across the Bay with the other uh, community colleges. And what we want to do with these funds is do what I'm calling create a pathway and a pipeline for us, a partnership between those institutions and our institution where the students can pretty much come and transfer students and typically attend UMES almost free of charge. So that's where we're wanting to leverage these particular funds to build us a, a solid financial um, base 
that will serve for generations of students to come. More importantly, by keeping the funds in, in endowment, we'll make sure that we also sustain the institution and leverage the funds with other uh, um, uh, financial funds that we need to have to make sure that we continue the, the university stability. Moving to the final point question that the analyst asked us to respond to, and that is looking at mental health and what happened after COVID. We all know that every university in the state, in the country, pivoted to online after March. We happened to have started our institution early in the summer. We started in early August and we ended in November with a full fall semester of not having to close and a low positivity rate. And that was thankful to the CARES money we received to take care of testing, but also to take care of safety. However, we know that our students suffered when they were at home in the spring semester. And one of the areas will happen to be mental health. So during spring semester, the response to the COVID pandemic, we used funds from the CARES Act to actually purchase uh, virtual mental health services. Specifically, our counseling services pivoted to virtual services on March 16th of 2020 and informed all of the students that we were moving to having virtual tele mental health. We did that by enhancing our social uh, media awareness campaign, getting information out to the students to let them know about that. In the fall, we returned half to 50% of our students returned to the campus in a de-densified approach. And we offered camp counseling services and mental health services in a hybrid map fashion, face-to-face -face as well as on uh, virtually. Our UMES psychiatrists and counseling staff were available on campus for crisis situations while individual counseling and group sessions were offered virtually. Anecdotally, the counseling directors across the USM saw a decline in utilization of services compared to previous years at the start of fall semester. The data from our counseling services indicates similar to this trend, but, but I, wanted to I want you to see, and you have it in my testimony there, the spring and summer hours, a number of hours, and you can see from fall to spring, uh, the fall numbers did go up a little bit. Shifting to how we've learned from providing courses online, the first thing we learned is if you live on the Eastern Shore, whether you're a faculty member or a student or staff, the bandwidth is really problematic over here. And um, we had blips with our students learning, we had blips with faculty, and this is even after we used CARES funding to give people hotspots and all of the technology that we could afford to give them. But needless to say, we try to look at things from a standpoint of how do we you know, take these particular crises and turn them into opportunities. And that's what my team and I are doing. And so we learned that our students, when they were home and developed their they, foundational courses, like in English and math, we've got to teach those in a different format. So this gave us the opportunity to transition our math department into a new area. And they're looking at a whole new way of teaching. I am so excited about it because I know our students coming in next fall are going to see a, a whole different pedagogy that's going to really help them. We also looked at revising several of our courses. And so we looked at things like existing resources that we had, we could actually develop a sports management program, a sports management degree, a digital media studies. These are things that have, are in demand and are, and, are, and are needed without utilizing any more resources. I am really thrilled about what we're doing across our five schools. From an interdisciplinary point, just one example that we shared with you, we have art in one place and, and we're combining that with counseling and psychology in another and creating this new art therapy uh, program that will be very, very helpful for healthcare and on the shore. We're strengthening certificates and digital pathways. And we're also continuing to look at how we can use virtual advising going forward uh, for all of our students, whether they're on, on, on ground or online. And the last thing that we're looking at from a lessons learned moving forward is our expansion into the regional health, into the regional centers in Shady Grove and Hagerstown. And we can see what we've learned here from a hybrid and a distance approach. We will be able to do that uh, a lot more effectively. So in summary, I just wanna say, instead of returning to normal, what UMES plans to do and what my team, what I'm encouraging my team is, we're gonna take the opportunity that has been afforded to us by the pandemic to create what we call our new normal it will reflect our mission, being affordable, being accessible to students, but also providing a learning environment that is valuable to the citizens of the state 
and maintain our financial efficiencies. Again, I wanna thank you for allowing me time to respond to the analyst uh, remarks today. And again, please approve our budget from USM. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your thorough presentation and answering all the analyst questions. I think there are some questions. Uh, Chair Zucker. Senator Elfrith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairs. Uh, President Anderson, good to see you. Thank you for going into such context. And I think we're all, I watched heads nod at um, the potential new programs that you, you plan on maybe bringing to the campus. I think are very exciting. Um, I, I try to focus in on this with, with all the presidents, the six year graduation rate. Um, and UMS was, was on a really great trajectory and it looks like you, you, it slipped just a little bit in the 2015 cohort. Can you give us some context as to maybe? I believe that I can, even though I wasn't here, I have researched that particular cohort myself. Okay. Um, in the 2015 cohort, we brought in a number of students, a large number, of, uh, it was one of the high, largest classes we ever brought in, first year classes. But in that first year class, many of the students were ill-prepared and we were not set up to really deal with the re remediation that those students needed. In addition to that, from a retention standpoint, the university had not structured itself in a way to be able to deal with the advising and other things that students uh, need, especially when they have remedial issues. Mm -hmm. That is something you can see why I preference my remarks by saying I restructure things when I arrive and have added in other people, advising, tutoring, those kind of things, because we want to be the university of access, but we also want to make sure when we bring in those large classes that we can handle the students as well. And then we've added another layer is that the faculty and getting them and the staff developed. So I apologize for the long response, but that's kind of what happened in 2015. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. We all are, are passionate about making sure that the students we recruit um, are successful, gain degrees, and it's best for the whole, the whole scenario. So thank you very much. I appreciate that context. You're welcome. We do have a question from the House side and I, Neglected to introduce our vice chair because this is not his first year on year on ED. He's only in his third year in the legislature. He's already two years as vice chair. Vice Chair Solomon, welcome. You have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to <clears throat> good to be back, um, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, um, thank you for being here. And I would actually echo Senator Elfis' uh, question and appreciate your uh, your comments on on retention. I know it's also a big priority for for Dr. Perman. So you know, anything in the future that we can do, or any thoughts or ideas on innovative programs, would would love to to have a follow up conversation. Um, my my question is a little bit more parochial, but I was really glad to hear you mention um, University of Shady Grove. And uh, in talking to a lot of the, the economic development folks in Montgomery County, um, they're constantly singing the praises of UMES's uh, hospitality program. And there's actually been uh, been a push to try to see if maybe we could increase the size of that with uh, Marriott's new headquarters coming online and, and with Hilton. So just curious if, if maybe in the works, um, you know, we could think about trying to expand the, the footprint um, and Adam would love to see maybe that pipeline program with, uh, with Montgomery College um, to get more, more students into the hospitality program to grow that industry. Delegate Solomon, you're reading our minds. We are have now made inroads with Montgomery uh, Community College. That is one of the community colleges that we're working with and we'll be working with more closely. But more importantly, we're looking at trying to do not only an in-person with our HTM program, but also some kind of hybrid online per, a program. And we hired a brand new department chair who is focusing on recruiting very differently in that particular area. And so we have a, a lot of uh, a new approaches that we're going to be putting in place. Uh, we even had Marriott here on our campus because, as you know, we have a 1,000 acre campus and there's space in the town of Princess Anne to do some growth, some economic development. And Marriott is one of the places, institutions that's been talking to us about building in this area, but also we could see that partnership across the Bay as well. So uh, we're excited about the potential where we're going to be going in the future. Um, if it hadn't been for COVID, we would have seen a lot of change this year from us. That's great. Thank you very much. Dr. Anderson, before we move on to the next budget, just had a quick question, and I, I think you already sort of addressed it, but you all reflected in the budget analysis that you were surprised that some of your students didn't feel safe or supported or encouraged at their homes. Was that, um, was that addressed through your mental health services? It, it was when they were when they went home for spring, we tried to address it through the mental health services, and that was why we pivoted so quickly to getting virtual mental health. But we know that our campus is, a, is, it is their home. For some of our students, this is their only home. 
And so we know when we, and that was also why we just brought them back. We even before time, we just said, we knew they had situations where the, whatever was going on in the family area, they needed to come back here. So we kept about 50 students on campus during that spring semester and um, we're seeing more of them come back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ch Chairman Barnes, I don't see any other questions. So um, we'll move on to the Maryland Economic Development Corporation. We'll start off with the uh, budget an analyst, uh, Emily Haskell, Ms. Haskell. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, I'm gonna start sharing. Uh, can everyone see the financial statement data on page one? We can. Great. Uh, my name is Emily Haskell and I'll be presenting the analysis for the Maryland Economic Development Corporation or MEDCO. I'm gonna start on page one with the financial statement. And the main takeaway here is that MEDCO's net operating income in fiscal 2020 uh, remained positive at $2.5 million, although this is a significant decline compared to prior years, as operating revenues declined 19% compared to fiscal 2019. Also on the last line, uh, you can see that MECO ended fiscal 2020 with negative net assets at about negative $300 million, driven primarily by yearly income deficits for the Chesapeake Bay Conference Center project, uh, which I'll discuss a little later. I'm going to jump to exhibit two on page seven, uh, which shows the change in net assets by project. Medco operated a total of 15 facilities in fiscal 2020, mostly student housing projects. Uh, this includes a new mixed use project at Bowie State, which will include more than 500 beds, as well as retail space, classrooms, and an entrepreneurship center. Uh, construction began in February of last year and is expected to be complete this summer. Uh, with an anticipated opening in time for the fall 2021 semester. Uh, this project is in addition to the Kristen McAuliffe student housing project that MEDCO has operated at Bowie State since 2004. A net asset deficit is not necessarily a concern for projects as long as they continue to have positive operating income as most of MEDCO's operating projects do. Exhibit three on page eight uh, shows the operating income by project. As I mentioned, the net operating income for MEDCO's projects declined uh, quite a bit due to the pandemic this year. And it's worth noting that this exhibit only shows the revenues and expenses through June 2020. So it doesn't show the full effects of the pandemic so far. Uh, you can see the Chesapeake Bay Conference Center project posted a loss of $12 million in fiscal 2020. Uh, this is MEDCO's only non-performing project as it has been since 2014. Uh, the project usually generates most of its revenues in the spring and summer, so it was hit particularly hard by the pandemic, which caused the facility to close in March and then had limited capacity uh, following the reopening of the hotel in June. Uh, investors have extended a short-term forbearance agreement through the end of June 2021 and have allowed reserve funds to be used to support operational costs. Although many of MECO's other projects also suspended operations or reduced capacity due to the pandemic, MECO expects all other projects to continue to be able to make their full debt service payments uh, in fiscal 2021, although some may need to use their reserve funds to do so. The Baltimore City Garages project also went on watch status in July uh, with fewer parking customers due to the pandemic, uh, resulting in declining revenues. MECO has retained a parking consultant for the project, but expects the recovery to be slow. Two of MEDCO's non-operating projects are also in watch status, and those are the Purple Line project as well as a residential building in Baltimore City. Lastly, I want to talk about student housing. Uh, in March, the University System of Maryland and Morgan State University uh, switched to remote learning for the rest of the semester and uh, for the rest of the spring semester, and MEDCO issued refunds to students living in MEDCO projects at the request of those institutions. Uh, the fiscal 2022 allowance does include a $1 million deficiency appropriation for the University System of Maryland office in fiscal 2021 uh, to compensate MEDCO for losses resulting from this release of students. In the fall, many schools continue to deliver most courses remotely, so some students chose not to return to their student housing. Exhibit 4 on page 10 shows the status of housing agreements at certain institutions that experienced uh, occupancy issues this fall. At UMBC, student leases were a bit different from some of the other housing projects and students were able to cancel their contracts right up until move-in. Uh, Morgan State and University of Maryland Baltimore reached agreements with MEDCO earlier in the year to make payments to MEDCO for released students, 
and Towson University and University of Maryland College Park each reached agreements with Medco in December, uh, splitting the operating shortfall with Medco for releasing certain students from their licenses. Exhibit five on page 11 shows information on the debt for Medco student housing projects. Uh, because of releasing students in the spring and low occupancy, several of the housing projects have been classified in watch status. Uh, those are College Park, UMBC, UMB, Salisbury, Towson, and Bowie State. Salisbury was later removed from watch status in September. As seen in the exhibit, many of these projects failed to meet the required debt coverage ratio of 1.2 at the end of fiscal 2020. Um, Medco expects that as long as occupancy rates this spring are the same or better than in the fall, all of the projects will be able to cover all operating expenses and debt service for fiscal 2021. And Medco also expects a quick recovery for these projects once occupancy can return to pre-pandemic levels. Finally, Medco is a non-budgeted entity and DLS has no recommendations. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Haskell, for that thorough analysis. Do any members of the committee, uh, either committee, have any questions for the analyst? I don't see any. Um, with that, we'll now turn it over to uh, Medco. Uh, Mr. Robert Brennan, if you want to uh, start and uh, can kick it off to any members of your team after you're done. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Zucker, Chairman Barnes, and members of the committee. Um, I'm actually going to be joined with uh, Jeff Wilkie and Jim Miller. Jim Miller is our CFO. Jeff is responsible for our student housing and our uh, bond issuance. Um, I've provided uh, two uh, forms of testimony. One was a, a Reader's Digest version of our annual report, and then also uh, testimony to response to the observations that uh, Emily has uh, just shared with you. Um, first, I wanna thank Emily for doing a very good job of uh, reviewing Medco. I think she encapsulated um, a pretty uh, horrific year um, brought on by the pandemic. Um, it has brought uh, numerous challenges, uh, particularly in the uh, student housing and at the uh, Chesapeake um, Hyatt Resort. Um, there's actually some good news uh, at Medco. We we're very lucky because part of our business is also doing development and um, our real estate development activities um, went on without a hitch. In fact, we uh, broke ground at Bowie in February, um, and that project is continuing to move unabated um, and is still scheduled to open up on time and under budget. Um, we were working with the National Park Service up in um, Williamsport, um, a nice project for uh, Washington County and the town up there. Um, I can tell you I was very fearful that construction projects were going to come to a halt uh, the contracting community, I think, took some very proactive measures, safety measures and protocols to uh, maintain uh, safe work environments. And in fact, uh, the National Park Service project um, is going to be completed uh, next month. And we'll be doing the uh, uh, move in and installation of some of their IT and equipment. And we hope to have the park services uh, occupying the building. Uh, they want to be in April 1st. I reminded them that's April Fool's Day, but they still want to move in on April 1st. Um, so there are some good things. Um, the uh, financial downfalls, um, part of my written testimony does capture what's going on at the uh, Hyatt and the student housing. Um, as Emily pointed out, with the student housing, uh, we significantly depleted a lot of our reserves uh, to provide the refunds when the governor did their shut, his shutdown order back in March. Um, and as she pointed out, we also had uh, a number of facilities where we had arrangements to either limit housing for the fall occupancy um, or arrangements for the universities to uh, uh, help uh, fund some of the shortfalls. Um, we had a lot of concerns with parents and uh, students at University of Maryland College Park and Towson University. Interesting thing is um, our occupancy the real occupancy at College Park was in the 70% range. Um, by the fall, I think a lot of the uh, students, particularly their parents, were trying to get the kids out of the living room and uh, uh, back on campus. And um, fortunately, I think a lot of the students acted very responsibly. Um, they took this pandemic very seriously. 
And uh, we generally had a very healthy uh, living environment for the students. So uh, that actually turned out well. Um, we do have some arrangements to provide accommodations for uh, students that had requested uh, their leases to be terminated. And um, you know, I don't think everybody's gonna be 100% happy, but I think we came to a, a fairly good uh, resolution. Um, that the Hyatt Cambridge, I will tell you during the summer uh, from the Hyatt properties, um, as you can imagine, most of their urban um, projects uh, were pretty much down to uh, dismal occupancy levels. Um, we reopened back on June uh, 22nd, I believe. And uh, our summer, uh, relatively speaking, was very successful. We limited occupancy to no more than 65%. Um, we felt that was about as safe as we could operate. And uh, we, we did fairly well. Uh, the investors who uh, support this project um, worked with us. Uh, we had been working under a forbearance arrangement. Uh, I think we entered into four or five different uh, forbearance arrangements during the summer. They kept us on a short lease, uh, le uh, leash, um, but we were able to um, uh, perform. I think they were pleased with the performance. Um, fact of the matter is uh, back in uh, April and May, we asked them to uh, defer the June 1st uh, interest payment of 3.8 million. The idea was to keep cash in the business. Um, they did do that. And with the other reserves, um, we believe we will be able to um, get through to June of next year, of this year now, um, and uh, still have some of our original operating cash and without uh, um, invading those reserves. Uh, I'm not sure when it's gonna come back. I can tell you a lot of the group business that was uh, canceled wasn't uh, written off the books. It's all been pushed to future periods. I think once we get to a high level of, uh, of um, I guess we call it herd immunity, um, and I'm not sure when that's gonna be, um, I think we'll get back to normal. I do think uh, hospitality has taken, uh, uh, been hurt particularly bad by this pandemic. And you know, I think once we get to the other side, uh, we're gonna be better off. I think we've had a lot of lessons. Uh, we figured out how to operate uh, differently in many different ways. and um uh, we're we're going to be around um it's been a slug but we're getting there and then the uh, city garage actually the one of the interesting things with that was uh, when we acquired those we knew we had to do a lot of capital repairs again uh we had started contracting to do repairs um uh, last year uh, the repairs were supposed to go on and be completed in december um if you've driven through baltimore recently the commute is very easy. And I think contractors were able to get to work very uh, quickly. And the fact of the matter is we finished all our repairs in August. So um, it's gonna be important for people to start coming back to work. We are fortunate that we have a, a couple of our uh, facilities are, uh, support condominiums above them. So we already have a fixed base of customers. It's the transient customers that aren't there. Uh, we actually do a lot of business with the uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore and their medical system, and they have uh, uh, contracts with us also. And that um, uh, base of business has provided us a, a solid uh, uh, revenue stream to at least cover the operating costs and what have you. But we need people to start getting back to work. Um, I do think it will come back. It's just a matter of when. So uh, that's our testimony. Uh, you have a lot that I've given you to read. Uh, feel free to go through it. Uh, we did have a good year uh, last year with uh, closing on some financings. We actually refinanced the uh, Maryland State Health Lab. Um, it's actually a, what it call, it's called a forward delivery. We closed on the financing um, right when this pandemic stuff was hitting. I think it closed in early June. Um, the actual transaction will provide the financial impact uh, this March, um, but we were able to take debt state, basically a state project that had debt, I think it was about 3.6% and refinance down to 1.19%. It's saving uh, Department of Health over a million dollars a year, uh, putting that transaction together. And that's just one of the examples. Um, we're still very busy. We just closed on a project with Morgan State University for 
uh, their student um, uh, housing facility and a, um, uh, a dining facility. And that will be opening up in August of 22. And Dr. Wilson had this as one of his high priority projects. And again, uh, in March, I was very dubious of whether or not these things were gonna move forward. Um, the university uh, asked us to stay with them in lockstep and we continued moving it forward. And it's gonna be a nice asset for the university. Plenty of other not good things going on, but um, that's recap of Medco for last year and a little insight of what you're gonna see uh, uh, this year. Thank you very much. I think you covered, uh, covered most of it. We do have some questions. But I just, uh, out of courtesy, was there anyone else from your team that, that was planning on testifying? I think, again, I think you covered everything, but I just. Uh, only, only if you have a question that I can't answer. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Senator Elford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Um, you know, we, we've received quite a, a lot of feedback from constituents across the state about the, the leases at University of Maryland and, and Towson University. Um, I, I appreciate that you were able to reach a resolution for, for maybe 70% of those of folks stuck in those leases, but you know, I, I have a dozen emails in front of me right now um, of, of folks who are still in limbo. Um, folks that have not attended a single in-person class since campus is shut down this time last year um, and are still stuck and locked into leases. And um, frankly, a lot of the feedback is, is about the universities and Medco respectively. Um, not simply not answering or not being willing to work something out. And so I have a couple of questions related to that. Um, it seems like there's there's kind of two different, and I appreciate, I used to serve on the Board of Regents, so believe me, I appreciate individual campuses. But it seems like students at Towson uh, were released for both fall and spring semesters, but not uh, students at University of Maryland. Can you, can you explain the different approaches to the two campuses, please? Um, sure, at Towson University, um, there is a freshman sophomore um, housing facility. It's called Packet and Tubman. Um, the university um, came back in the fall and said that for the spring semester, they wanted to limit that to uh, one student per room. Um, the, uh, what the, the other uh, housing facility at Millennia Hall is much like what we have at College Park. And that is each student has their own room. They uh, might share, two students might share one bath. And uh, Towson University came back and said, uh, they felt that, uh, and College Park have said the same, they think uh, it's safe putting students in an environment where they have their own bedroom, where they share a bath. They did not want two students in a room. So because Pack and Tubman had two students in the room, uh, we treated th that, those two facilities uh, different. And that's why we were releasing students from Pack and Tubman and not the uh, uh, suite type housing. Okay, what about Towson students who prepaid for their fall tuition? Um, they, they got out of their leases, but they're given a credit for future Medco housing, not, not the refund. Now, if you're a graduating senior, wh where does that put you? We will make accommodations if they're a graduating se senior. Okay. Uh, the, the idea was um, most of the students um, were, uh, were not graduating. So there could be a situation. Okay, but for graduating seniors, you will work with them to figure this out. Sure. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, just uh, one or two more questions if I have, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, moving, moving to the University of Maryland um, and I think my number of questions shows the, the extent of the, the challenge here. Uh, they were told they could be released from the fall semester if they notified management by August 12th, 2020 with the intent to cancel. I, I appreciate that there needs to be rules, there needs to be timelines, but is there any reason for this arbitrary date far before the semester began? Well, the, the university on their own on-campus housing, they allow releasing uh, up to a certain date. Um, that, that date was um, the date the university wanted us to use. I'm not sure exactly how they chose August 12th, mm -hmm. but I suspect it coincided with their own housing as to when they would allow students to be released. Okay, last question, Mr. Chair. Um, it seems that you're 
Medco is allowing tenants at Maryland University of Maryland to be released from the spring semester if they're fine, they can find someone to re take their lease. Um, so you're replacing the entire burden of that lease on 20 year olds. Um, this just doesn't seem like a, the best market strategy or like it's gonna be successful overall. I, I guess you can hear my frustration. Well, um, we, we had the same policy in the fall and I can tell you, I had a student who was calling me um, uh, probably back in the August, September period. And I told him, look, you know, if you want to get out, you can try to find somebody. Um, I got all kind of invective emails from him. Um, but uh, interesting part was uh, he ended up getting released because he found somebody to take over the lease. And I was kept telling him there are students that the university has displaced that they are referring to our property. And, you know, if you called in early August, go back and check because the university is continuing to send us names. So uh, we, we are uh, gonna be working um, with students that do not wanna come back. But again, our occupancy, I believe at College Park was, I'm gonna 75 plus percent. Um, we're normally at 99.8%. Um, I do think a lot of, we'll have more students this spring um, and the university has already indicated that uh, they will be sending us some um, additional names. So if the university is sending you names and I'm a leasee that wants to get out of my lease, the university is not sending me those names for me to then talk to those potential people to take over my lease. It just seems like there's a disconnect here that I would like you to think about. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Um, we're gonna continue to get these emails from constituents and taxpayers until this is resolved. So I'm gonna ask you to please put your heads together and find a resolution for these families and for these students. Thank you. We have a question from the House side, Vice Chair Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Brennan, I guess I just had a follow-up question on College Park um, as well. I think a number of us have received emails too. The one question I had is, and I, I can't remember exactly when we had our briefing back in December, but I know your agreement with College Park is slightly different than Towson. And I was going back and looking at it because I don't think we had, uh, I don't think it had been signed yet. Um, so it looks like in the, in the agreement with College Park, you're not able to essentially, if you have the, you know, for the spring semester, if you, if you can't find somebody and you're not there at Towson, you're able to roll that credit over for the following year at College Park, that doesn't seem like it's allowed. You're only allowed to roll the credit into the spring, but if you are, if you're unable to, to transfer or, you know, one of the emails I got from a student said they're not, you know, all of their, all of their classes are online. It seems to me like a reasonable solution would be, you know, if they wanted to move back in next fall, they're not senior, they're not a senior. So could a student at College Park carry over a credit into the 21-22 academic year, or is it just this year? Uh, Jeff, do you have an answer to that? Jeff, you're on mute. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're still um, working through uh, some of the some of the you know exceptions that have uh, come about as the. Um, settlement agreement was um, kind of rolled out. There, there's been a lot of communication between the management company and the, the individual students surrounding um, you know, the, the circumstances for each particular individual. I, I think that's one of the things we're still working to, to, to find resolution for. Great, I was gonna say, because in, in reading the agreement, it just seems to, the only credit seems to be towards the spring term housing. And I think that's a reasonable, for, for students who aren't seniors, obviously, I think that's a reasonable thing to say you know, you can roll this over into next year or whenever, whenever you're back on campus. And I would hope, uh, hope you all can reach an agreement on that for, for some of these students too. Understood. Thank you. Uh, you, know, you know, Mr. Brennan, this is obviously something that this can, both of these committees have been concerned about all the way back to August. I know that we had a hearing in the fall and I know that you've done some great work and as Senator Elforth put it, 70% is good. Um, and we're appreciative of that, but we would like to see some of these loose ends dealt with. And I know a lot of this burden goes on to the universities. So I think we will continue to be advocating to the University of Maryland to deal with these loose ends. But to the extent you can respond to some of the things raised by Delegate Solomon, Delegate Elfrith and get back to our committee, that would certainly be appreciated. All right, well, any uh, questions from these committees for Mr. Brennan? 
All right. Well, we don't, don't want to lose sight of all the other good work you do, Mr. Brennan. So thank you for all that. Thanks for being with us and tell PJ I said hello. I will. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, any closing remarks, Mr. Chairman? No, no. Okay. Uh, I do want to remind the members of EED that we do have another Zoom that's been sent to your emails. We are voting on a couple of bills immediately following this Zoom. So please log off and log on to that. And with that, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.